sister, and then he had one full brother, Benjamin, who was the baby of the family. And uh, his parents were Jacob and Rachel. It was during the days of polygamy, and so that's thus he had half brothers and a half sister. Uh, Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife, and so it became normal for Jacob to be a little partial to the firstborn son of his favorite wife. And let's begin by looking at the third verse of Genesis chapter 37. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children. Wow. You're talking about seeds for a dysfunctional family. <laughs> for it to be known that uh, Papa loved Joseph more than any of his children and made a special coat for him. Uh, you know, in the modern era, we try to love all of our children the same. And if we don't love them the same, we at least don't let anybody know about it, as a rule. But we have some dear friends, and the woman, she and her husband have two sons. And she lets it be known that she loves one of those boys more than the other. Uh -huh. And they have four grandchildren, and she loves one of those grandchildren more than the other three. And uh, have said to us, I don't know how many people, but it said to us, I love him more than the other three grandchildren. Well, as uh, far as I know, hopefully, the grandchildren don't know the difference. I don't know that. I'm not around the grandchildren. But I do know that, that the boy who is the least loved knows he's not loved as much as his older brother. And uh, consequently, he and his family are not around his parents nearly as much as the other son is around the parents. Uh, I just can't imagine the kind of tension in the family that it creates when one of the parents loves one of the children more than the other children. When I was younger, I was confident <coughs> that I was my mother's favorite. And then as I got older, I realized that all my siblings thought they were mother's favorite. And uh, I think that's the way it ought to be. We ought to love all of our children the same. If we don't, it sows the seed for dysfunction in the family. Now, Jacob exemplified his love for Joseph by making him this expensive coat. And uh, then Joseph had two dreams. The first dream was of the sheaves bowing down to him. And the second dream was of the sun and the moon bowing down to him. And his brothers uh, asked him what that meant. And he explained to them it meant they were going to be subservient to him. Well, when you're your papa's favorite, and you have that kind of dream, and you tell the meaning of the dream to your brothers, I mean, why tell them the dream at all? We'll find out later why he told them. But on first read, it seemed like one of the dumbest things he could do would be to tell his brothers about this dream. Well, you remember the story. Papa sends Jacob, I mean Joseph, Jacob sends Joseph to check on the brothers who are herding the sheep in a foreign county. 
several hours walking distance away from home. He hadn't heard from them. They didn't have any way of communicating <coughs> back then. So Papa hadn't heard from his 11 boys and he sends Joseph to check on them. I've got this stupid phone I don't know how to turn off. You don't have to turn that phone off. <laughs> Thank you. I tried to turn I it off. It. I'll uh -oh. silence it and give it back to you later. So okay. I don't leave you with a silent phone and I don't know how to turn back on. <laughs> well, I apologize for that, but I did try a few minutes ago to turn it off, and it's smarter than I am. And I was not able to do so. Okay, back to the story. Uh, Joseph takes off to find his brothers and uh, when they see him coming they said here comes that dreamer what will we do to him and they decide to kill him and uh, Reuben the oldest boy intervenes and says no let's don't kill him uh, and it, it would kill dad if we kill him. And they come up on this pit in the ground. And Reuben, in order to save his younger brother, says, let's throw his coat, and let's throw him in the pit. And they decide to kill a lamb and to soak his coat in blood and to send the coat back to Jacob and let Jacob think that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. Now, you can see the dysfunction in the family coming out in that act. And uh, so they did so. And much to Joseph's good luck, these foreign traders from Egypt come along and Reuben says, let's sell him, get some value out of him. Let's sell him into slavery. And so they sold him into slavery. And he was taken to Egypt. And he was sold to Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was one of the king's right-hand men and one of the most important people in the government. I was thinking last night about that verse in Romans, all things work together for good, is the way the King James translates it. But the better translation is that God works all things together for good to those who love him. And we're going to see in the life of Joseph that God indeed works all things together for good. Doesn't mean everything's good. A lot of bad things happen that are not good, even to good people. But God takes the bad things that happen to us and works them for good. Not always immediately, but ultimately, God will work for good the bad things in our lives if we'll turn to Him for good. And that happened in Joseph's case. We see in the 39th chapter that Joseph was a natural born leader. Let's look there at verses 3 through 6 of chapter 39. His master, that's Potiphar, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. Potiphar made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. 
So Joseph, being blessed of God, becomes a natural leader and becomes in charge of Potiphar's entire household and his farming enterprise. And uh, then we know what happened after that. In verses 7 through 20, we find that Potiphar's wife uh, was infatuated by Joseph, and she kept making advances toward Joseph. And Joseph kept <coughs> saying, your husband's put me in charge of everything, and except you, and I can't succumb to your advances. And, of course, she was offended by that. So one day, he's in the house, and he's the only servant in the house. And she tries to get him to go to bed with him. And he refused to do it. And he fled the room, fled the house, but he left his coat of many colors in the house. And she started screaming. And the ser other servants heard her scream. And she told them that Joseph had tried to seduce her. Of course, just the opposite had happened. She had tried to seduce him. And Joseph was then imprisoned by Potiphar because he believed his wife and thought Joseph indeed had tried to seduce her. But even in jail, Joseph was a leader. Let's look at verses 21 through 23 of that chapter, 39th chapter. Verse 21, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him his steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in prison. And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Is Joseph a leader or not? He becomes the leader of Potiphar's household, in charge of everything Potiphar owned. Sent to jail and the chief jailer makes him in charge of everything that goes on in the jail house. So, he's a natural born leader. And uh, look at chapter 40, how he was a leader in prison. Look at that fourth verse of chapter 40. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, that is the, the king's butler and his cupbearer. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he waited on them and they continued for some time in custody. But one night, these two guys, the cupbearer and the chief butler, had a dream and uh, they couldn't interpret their dream. And uh, they turned to Joseph, and Joseph interpreted the dream. The dream of the cupbearer was that in three days he would be returned to his position as the king's cupbearer. And the butler's dream was that in three days the king would hang him. Well, you know the story. Three days passed. The cupbearer was returned to his original position as the cupbearer for the king. And the butler was hanged in three days. And Joseph said to the cupbearer, Remember me when you're freed from prison. And the Bible says he forgot about Joseph. Uh, why? Why? You'd think he would really be uh, appreciative enough of Joseph 
that he would remember that forever. But he forgot his promise to Joseph. Then comes the big dream in chapter 41. Pharaoh had a dream. And his dream was that there were seven sleek cows, shiny, full, healthy cows that came up out of the river. And then in an instant, seven starving, ugly cows came up out of the river. And he had another dream. There were seven full ears of corn. And immediately after that, seven ears of corn that were just off. Had no corn on the cob at all to speak of. And here the king is troubled by these two dreams. He doesn't know what to make about them. Aha! The cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison and says, uh, Hey, King, we had this guy in prison who interpreted my dream and the dream of the butler correctly. Maybe he can interpret your dream. Now, Joseph, before he interprets the butler and the cupbearer's dream, says, It's not I but God who is giving me the interpretation of your dream. Joseph's called before the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh tells him his dreams. And here again, Joseph says, It is not I, but God, who interprets the dream. And here's the interpretation of your dream. There are going to be seven years of plenty in Egypt represented by the seven full ears and the seven healthy cows. And those seven wonderful years are going to be followed by seven terrible years. Years of famine. And uh, the cupbearer after having kept his promise to Joseph saw Joseph flourish. Uh, Joseph's dreams he, that he interpreted came true. And they entered seven years of prosperity. And look at that 41st chapter beginning with verse 38. The Bible says, well, in verse 37, the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And the proposal was that they store up during these seven years of plenty. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone else like this one in whom is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command, only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh, Potiphar's house, Joseph becomes the leader. In prison, Joseph becomes the leader. Out of prison, he becomes second in command of all Egypt. Now you think Joseph wasn't a leader? He was one of the greatest leaders that ever lived. To have assumed all of this from being a boy his brothers were about to kill and thrown into a pit. Now what does it say to us about immigration for this kid from a foreign land to be a, be a slave 
in Egypt and rise to the very top. I'm reminded when we were in Knoxville that uh, we have to resettle a Vietnamese family. And uh, this Vietnamese father and his two sons got to America but left the wife and three daughters in a prisoner of war camp in the Philippines. And so we resettled this man who was an engineer and his two boys and he became a custodian at our church. An engineer who couldn't find work in this country and became a custodian. It wasn't long before he became the chief custodian in the church. And then two years, he found a job as an engineer. You know, it says, and by the way, the good part of that is that his wife and three daughters later joined him in this country. But there are so many people like him and like Joseph who when given the chance mm -hmm. can rise to a wonderful status of life if they only have an opportunity. And it happened for Joseph. Now, he married a foreign woman. He married an Egyptian woman. Uh, Asthenoth and had two half-blood sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And at the end of those seven years of plenty came the famine. Well, in Genesis 42, we find the story of Joseph's brothers starving to death back in Canaan. And they heard about the plenty in Egypt. And Jacob sent his 11 boys to Egypt to try to get enough food for them to survive on during the famine. The boys came to Egypt. And I hope you remember the story. Joseph recognized them and uh, left the room and wept bitterly. He didn't reveal himself. He recognized them, but he disguised who he was, and they didn't recognize him. And they explained to him that they were from the land of Canaan, that they had a daddy who was an old man and a younger brother who his daddy adored, their daddy adored, and that they had come to buy grain. And uh, Joseph said, I don't think you're telling the truth. I think you're spies. And uh, boy, they, they were upset with them. And so Joseph made a deal with them. He said, if you're really not spies, then let one of you stay here. And the others of you go back and bring the younger brother with you, and that will prove to me that you're telling the truth. So he sold them grain, and they loaded the grain in their saddleback bags, and they started back to Canaan. And they stopped along the way and discovered that the bunny they had paid for the grain was in their sacks. Scared them to death because they thought, you know, we're all going to be accused here. And they didn't know what to do. So they went back home with the food and they told their daddy all that had taken place. And they said, 
to prove we're not spies, we got to take Benjamin back with us and get Simeon released. Daddy said, no way. I'm not going to chance that because my son was killed. And now you want to take my youngest son. Well, how did it make the boys feel <laughs> for him to call Joseph my son and to call Benjamin my son? He would not let Benjamin go back with them. Chapter 43. They get hungry. They run out of grain. And they're starving to death. And Jacob says, go back to Egypt and buy more grain. And the boys say, he will not sell us more grain unless we take Benjamin. Well, the choice is pretty stark, folks. Do I keep my favorite son here and all of us starve to death? That phone's ringing again. You're not as smart as I thought you were. I give you a lot more credit than you deserve. I don't know how to turn it off either. But at any rate, the, start, the, the choice is pretty stark. Does Jacob hold on to his promise to keep Benjamin at home? Or does he send Benjamin with his brothers, half-brothers, to Egypt to get more grain? Well, he decides they're all going to die if they don't get more food. So he sends Benjamin with his half-brothers back to Egypt to see if he can buy more grain. And look at verse 26 of that 43rd chapter. Verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought him the present they had carried into the house, and they bowed, the brothers bowed to the ground before him. What does that remind you of? His dreams as a boy. That his brothers would bow down to him. Now they didn't know at this point that it was their brother <coughs> Joseph that they were bowing down to. But his dream was fulfilled. In chapter 43, when the brothers bowed down to him. And in chapter 44, we find the story of Joseph sending them back home with the food, the grain. But he put a silver chalice in Benjamin's bag and proposed when it was discovered he proposed that they keep that he keep Benjamin with him his only full brother and send the rest of them back now verse 45 has a wonderful story let's read verses 1 through 7 of chapter 45 brothers come back to him when they find the golden chalice in Benjamin's bag. And Joseph could no longer control himself before them. He could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. 
so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant of earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. God works all things together for good to those who love him. Not everything that happened to Joseph was good, to be sure. Being jailed, being accused of rape. But God worked all the bad things together for good. And many lives were saved because of Joseph. In chapter 46, we find that Joseph sent for Jacob. And Jacob and all of his families. Now, you can imagine how many children and grandchildren and wives. It must have been quite an enormous group of people. Because the entire family migrated to Egypt during this famine. And in chapter 47, we find a wonderful story about Jacob and all of his families settle, settling in the land of Goshen. And then in chapter 48, we find that, ja that Jacob is getting old and about to die. And before he dies, he calls Joseph's two sons and blesses them. And a weird thing, he blesses the younger one with the greatest blessing. Well, that's not the way things happen in that day. You always bless the elder. And Joseph said, no, Dad, you got it wrong. You're blessing the younger son with the biggest blessing. And Jacob said, no, I've got it right. And he blessed the younger son with the greater blessing. And then, in chapter 49... We find that Jacob called all of his sons together and blessed all of his sons. And look at that 33rd verse of the 49th chapter. Verse 33 of chapter 49. The Bible says, The field and the cave that were in it, I know, verse 33, when Jacob ended his charge to his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. So Jacob died in Egypt, in the land of Goshen. And we find in the 50th chapter that the boys kept their promise to their daddy. All the boys took Jacob back to Canaan and buried him among his people. But then the boys began to think, what if, J if Joseph has been nice to us because of daddy and didn't want to disappoint daddy what if he's going to get revenge on us now for throwing him in the pit and selling him as a slave? And look at chapter 50, verses 17 through 20. Verse 17. 
Say to Joseph, the brothers, say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive, he's quoting the, a makeup story here. Uh, say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crimes of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God, of your father. Jesus, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to, to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So Joseph forgave his brothers of what they had done to him. And then we find in the last few verses, beginning with verse 22, that Joseph died, uh, that Jacob, yeah, Joseph died in the land of Egypt. I think Joseph is the most Christ-like figure in the Old Testament. And I'd like for you, you to use your head here a little bit and list the ways that Joseph is like Jesus. He forgives Forgave. Strong forgiveness. Well, it wasn't easy, I'm sure, to do that. But he was he was a forgiving person. How else is Joseph like Jesus? Provides for our needs. He provided for the needs of his family. Good. He trusted God. He what? Trusted God. All right. Faith. He was a person of faith who trusted God. He gave God credit for all the things he was able to do. Yeah. Um, so he was uh, non-selfish. He's humble. Yes. <laughs> Pretty good guy, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. I think he was more like Jesus than any person in the Old Testament. Another way he was like Jesus. wound up in Egypt to survive. Yeah. A lot like Jesus. He doesn't deserve the credit. He doesn't. He deserves a lot more credit than we give him. Diane? We're done, huh? <laughs>